here with Vasis Nias and Mr. Ken Thompson, who's running for the position of Brooklyn District Attorney. Thank you so much for agreeing to this interview. Thank you for having me. Let's assume that you win the election. How do you see improving Brooklyn? What areas are you going to focus on? What are you going to do differently than the current district attorney? Well, one of the first things we're going to do in the DA's office is we're going to make sure that every investigation and every prosecution is based on integrity and that is done with fundamental fairness. We must have a DA's office that treats people fairly, that is determined to keep us safe, but that will make sure that innocent people are not brought into the criminal justice system and charged with crimes that they did not commit. So from day one, I'm going to make sure my staff understands that there will be no withholding of evidence, there will be no cheating, that everyone in the criminal justice system is going to be given a fair chance. Well, that's, that's in the D, DA's office, but most of the problems have been occurring from the police department, have they not? Well, if you bring up the issue of stop and frisk, I think the DA can play a more active role with respect to stop and frisk that are occurring on the streets of Brooklyn. The majority of the stop and frisk that occur in the city happen in East New York and in Brownsville. We lead the city in stop and frisk. The current DA, Joe Hines, has been utterly silent on this issue. There have been tens of thousands of young men who have been stopped and frisked on the streets of Brooklyn unjustly, and he has not said one word about that. As Brooklyn DA, I intend to make sure that the stop and frisk that occur are based on reasonable suspicion, the way the Supreme Court said it has to be done. I want to get these guns off the street. I have a young family. My wife and I are raising two young children. My daughter Kennedy is only eight. My son Kenny is only six. I want to make sure that they're safe, that all of the children and all the families of Brooklyn are safe. But we can't just allow innocent people to have their civil rights violated as part of excessive stop and frisk. And I want to do something about it. What are you going to do if the issue is coming from the police department? Like uh, last year, for example, there were a number of cases that Mr. Hines had to give up because of just corruption in the police department, because of uh, unfair tactics, because of made-up things. Uh, how, are you going to, uh, how are you going to address that that's coming from the police department? What I intend to do is to work with the police department hand-in-hand hand, to make sure that officers are adequately trained as to what constitutes reasonable suspicion when it comes to a stop and frisk. The Supreme Court is clear in the Terry case. It said that in order for a law enforcement officer to be able to stop someone, they must have reasonable suspicion that that person committed a crime or was about to commit a crime. And in order to search that person, they must have reasonable and articulable suspicion that the person is armed and dangerous. It can't be based on a hunch. It has to be based on something that they can point to, such as a bulge or a handle of a gun. Clearly, that's not happening in many of these stop and frisk cases. Young men have been stopped and frisked, told to empty out their pockets. And some of them who have marijuana on them have been then brought into the criminal justice system. I think that we have to go about it a different way. I support stop and frisk if it's done the right way, the way the Supreme Court requires. If it's done the right way, we can save lives, we can get guns off the streets. But if it's done the wrong way, it only undermines the very important relationship that we must have between the police and the community. Okay. Uh, you mentioned dealing with police brutality. Uh, how are you going to come down on police brutality, you know, aside from the stop and frisk, uh, without alienating the police department? Well, as you may know, I'm a former federal prosecutor right here in Brooklyn. Right. I spent many years in the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I prosecuted the Abner Louima case, where we put five New York City police officers on trial. And we convicted police officer Justin Volpe at trial for what he did to Abner Louima. He committed some of the most horrific acts of police brutality ever committed in the history of the city. You know, he got married, by the way, last year. Are you aware of that? I didn't know that. I didn't know that. I will say this. There are many, many, many good cops. The vast majority of them are good. They put their lives on the line for us. They work very hard. They're dedicated to protecting us. Yes, there's some cops who are bad. There's some bad lawyers. There's some bad doctors. They're no bad journalists, though. And so the cops who cross the line have to be dealt with. And so I think that the good cops want that. 
because no one wants a cop who's going to brutalize civilians. And so what I intend to do is I intend to support the police, but when they cross the line, I'm going to have to investigate and prosecute those officers. I'll give you an example. There was a shooting in my neighborhood some years ago involving a young man named Shem Walker. Shem Walker was an Army veteran who was watching his mother's brownstone in the Clinton Hill section of Brooklyn. And he came out of her house one day and saw someone sitting on the stoop of his mother's house, told the gentleman to leave. One thing led to another and they started fighting. What Shim Walker didn't know was that gentleman was an undercover New York City police officer. And that police officer pulled out his gun and shot Shim Walker three times and killed him. Now, that happened in July of 2009. It is now August of 2013. And Joe Hines still hasn't made a decision in that case. That doesn't make sense. If that was a justifiable shooting, then he has an obligation to vindicate and clear the cop and let the community know why it was a, a, a justifiable shooting. And if it was a bad shooting, then he has an obligation to, to prosecute the police right. officer. But what he decides to do is he fails to act. That is not in the interest of the people of Brooklyn. He does what's in his political interest. And it's in his political interest not to make any decision in that case. And that is wrong. And when I become DA, I'm going to act to protect the people of Brooklyn and to support the police when they must be supported. Let's get back to uh, Abner Louima. Uh, you did put five officers on trial, but uh, it looks like only Justin Volby uh, had, you know, was convicted. The rest were, were overturned on appeal. Uh, there was one officer that received five years. How did that feel? You know, you saw things. Uh, I'm sure you, you know you 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 worked very hard on the Abner Louima case. I did. And uh, it must have been very, very frustrating to see that uh, the other officers just got off. There was cover-up. There was someone else in there, in that room, uh, with, with Volby. And yet, uh, and yet uh, you know, no, no one else was, uh, was convicted. How did that feel? Well, let me just say this. We got justice for Abner Louima. When you have these police brutality cases, it is very rare that New York City police officers are convicted at trial. And the fact that police officer Justin Volpe was sentenced to 30 years in federal prison was extraordinary. It showed the heinous nature of his attack on Abner Louima. Now, yes, I would have preferred that all the officers we, we put on trial were convicted. Okay. But, but one of the things I do is I respect the jury verdict, even if I disagree with it. Mm -hmm. That's what this country has to be based on. Okay. We have to have a fair system. We presented the evidence. We convicted Justin Volpe put guilty in the middle of the trial, and Char Officer Charles Schwartz was convicted at the end of the trial. And the jurors decided that other officers should not be convicted. I respect their decision. Mm -hmm. But I, it didn't take away from the great work that we put into that case. Let me ask you just another question. Uh, this is something that's, that's always bothered me. What Abner Louima did was, was horrific and was, and was heinous. It was just a, a you mean Justin Volpe? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, <laughs> Justin Volpe. Uh, but the uh, the fact is, he got 30 years. Yes. There's another case where Lemrick Nelson stabbed to death Yanko Rosenbaum, and Lemrick Nelson got out in less than 10 years. Okay. Now, what happened to Luima was, was, was terrible, but at the end of the day, you know, he he went home. He's got family. That didn't happen to Yanko Rosenblum. He got less than 10 years, Lemmerich Nelson, for a murder, right? And it was just a, a completely innocent, uh, the disparity of justice there is, is, uh, is, is just something that's hard to believe. Prosecutors are able to make requests uh, when they go after someone. They want, they, they want someone, okay, this person should go should be put away for 20 years, for 25 years, for 30 years. You're happy with the 30 years, but uh, how do you explain the disparity? And is there anything that you're going to do about it? Well, first of all, the Abner Louima case and the Limick Nelson case were handled by different judges. And so you have to look at all the facts in Louima that led Judge Eugene Nickerson to sentence him to 30 years in prison. And then you have to look at the case of Lemmerich Nelson 
and understand why the judge gave him that sentence. I'm going to be very proactive as a DA. I believe that people who commit crimes of violence should go away for a significant period of time because I must protect the community. We cannot have violent individuals remain among us because then we're all going to be in jeopardy. But at the same time, I think that we have to look at each case on its own and not think of one case represents a whole community. Yeah, but it I don't also sends that. a message, though. It sends a message that, okay, he only got 10 years. And uh, it's, in other words, what I'm asking is federal, there's, there's such a thing as federal sentencing guidelines. Yes. Okay? We don't have that on the district attorney level or on, or on these type of cases. But what I'm saying is, shouldn't there be something? In other words, if you have a cold-blooded murder, like the case with Yonkel Rosenbaum, where it was, it, it had to do with, it was a race issue, right? Yonkel Rosenbaum was killed because he was Jewish. Shouldn't there be something like federal sentencing guidelines from the district attorney's office in such a thing? Well, it depends on who you ask. Some I'm asking you. Well, some practitioners believe that the sentencing guidelines actually limit what federal judges can do. It takes away some discretion. What I believe is that if there's a case of someone being murdered unjustly, I believe the full weight of the law should come down on that person. I don't think you need federal or sentencing guidelines to tell you that. I think a judge should come down. And as a prosecutor, I'm going to ask for that. Now, it's hard for me to sit here now without having all the facts. But in a case where an innocent person is murdered, I'm going to have an obligation to make the argument why that person should go away for a long time. So I don't think we need sentencing guidelines to get us there. I think we just need a DA who's going to be committed to making the strongest argument possible. I understand, but do you feel there's a discrepancy here? Abner Luwima's torturer, or whatever you call it, got 30 years. Someone that murdered an innocent uh, person because of, because of race and religion and those type of things. Right, only got 10. Do you feel that there's an inherent unfairness? I, I, I see your argument about the discrepancy there. Yeah. And I, I don't disagree with the fact that that sentence seems very, very low to me. I wasn't involved in that Limerick Nelson case. But I think Luima, what Justin Volpe did to Abner Luima in that bathroom, was not just torture him with a broken broomstick, he did other things that we brought out at trial. That, that warranted his 30-year sentence. Is it all right if I ask you a, a t kind of a tough question? Ask me anything you want. Okay. Uh, after you went into uh, private law, yes. there was uh, someone that you successfully defended. He was accused of bringing in, uh, I think, a kilo of heroin uh, to JFK. And... Uh, it could, be I'm in, it could be I'm making a mistake, but you were able to get him off on kind of like uh, technicality. That's not true. Okay. Let so me tell you what happened. Okay. You're talking about a case involving a young man who was a cab driver who was falsely accused of being involved in a ring that brought heroin into the country. That case went to trial. I went back and I went against my old office, the U.S. Attorney's Office. And I presented the evidence to show that that young man had nothing to do with that, that drug transaction. And a jury, a trial jury, weighed all the evidence and it found him not guilty. There was no technicality. The evidence was presented by the, the, by the federal government, by the federal prosecutors who put my client on trial. I was his attorney. I went to court and I argued his case over a period of time during that trial. And the jury came back and found him not guilty. There were no technicalities. It was a hard-fought case, and I proved my client was innocent. Okay, but he had the, I mean, he was caught with the... That's not true. He wasn't caught, no. so they just made it up. No, what happened, without okay. going into detail, All right. my client was a cab driver. Someone who he took to the airport went to Columbia, came back a couple of days later with drugs. That person got caught. And at the airport, the agents flipped that person and said, who sent you? And he said, my client did. Uh -huh. My client was a cab driver who had nothing to do with that transaction. Uh -huh. he, was, he was set up by this guy who got caught at the airport. And I proved that the guy who was arrested was lying. And the jury understood it. My uh -huh. client never okay. had 
possess any of the drugs. He was a cab driver who was caught up in a bad situation because this guy was lying and falsely accused him. And the jury saw right through that. Uh-huh. Okay. Uh, the, uh, let's get to another, uh, another case in the news. Uh, you represented uh, a housekeeper in the Strauss-Kahn case. Yes, I did. Uh, and eventually, your client developed serious credibility issues where she had previously made up an allegation that she was attacked in her native country. When were you aware, and, and what happened was the DA's office ended up dropping the charges. I understand there was some sort of a settlement later in a civil case, but when were you aware of, uh, of your client having credibility issues? Well, let me say this. I believe my client was telling the truth then about what she accused Dominique Strauss of doing to her in that hotel room, as I believe her today. I stand by my client in that case. Mm -hmm. My client, the evidence of what happened in that hotel room never changed. That was the same evidence that they indicted Dominique Strauss Kahn on. Right, well the evidence was, I mean the issue was, was it, uh, was it consensual or not? But, well that uh, was the defense that they argued. Now look right. at our interview. Miss Diallo was in that hotel room for less than seven minutes. You and I have been talking for more than seven minutes. And in less than seven minutes, the argument was that she engaged right. okay. in consensual sexual activities with Dominique Strauss-Kahn. He admitted when he went back to France that he didn't know her. So it's ridiculous. Okay. And so I think that the evidence showed that she was attacked in that room. Okay. That case, your involvement in it, uh, you think it'll help, hinder, not affect your current, uh, current run for a district attorney? When I did that case, I did it because I felt very strongly in the fact that here was a woman who had come to this country from the west shores of Africa, and she had accused one of the most powerful men in the world of attempting to rape her. He was the head, Dominique Strauss-Kahn was the head of the International Monetary Fund. He was about to become the next president of France. Right. And Ms. Diallo needed a strong advocate, and that's what I gave her. And I hope people will draw from that a, a very important lesson. When that criminal case was dismissed, and everyone attacked her, she was being called a liar, and vilified throughout the world. I did not abandon her. I stood by her side because I believed in what they taught me at NYU Law School. And that is that everyone deserves equal justice and equal protection under the law. So if there's anything to, to draw from that, I hope people will draw the lesson that when I become Brooklyn DA, I'm gonna stand up for the people of Brooklyn. No matter how difficult the case, no matter what the political consequences are, I'm going to do what I believe is the right thing. That's why I'm running to make sure that we're safe on the streets, safe in our homes, and treated fairly with dignity and respect in the criminal justice system. Have you got a chance to look into the Colt Sedic program? And uh, what are your thoughts about it? Do you plan to continue it? Do you think there are any flaws in it? What I'm gonna do when I become Brooklyn DA is I'm gonna look at every program, every policy that's currently in effect. And we're gonna make an assessment of all the, all the programs, all the policies in effect to see if we should continue them, make them better, or change them. And so I intend to revamp the office from top to bottom. Do you have any preliminary thoughts on it, or you haven't gotten a chance to look at it? No, I need to look at it carefully, and when I become Brooklyn DA, I'll have access to all the information. Okay. Uh, the, uh, there's some people in the Jewish community that uh, sometimes make it difficult for people to come forward uh, when someone more entrenched in the community is accused of a crime. Uh, how do you plan to address that issue? And uh, are you planning to do anything different than the current district attorney uh, is doing? What I intend to do is I intend to make sure that we investigate wherever the evidence leads us. And that we're going to have one standard of justice. Everyone is going to be treated fairly. Everyone is going to be treated equally. Nope. I don't believe that we should target any community. See, the current DA, he has said some very horrible things about the Orthodox Jewish community. He has said that the Orthodox Jewish community is worse than the Mafia. My friend, the Mafia kills people. He has said that the patrols are worse than the Crips and the Bloods. My friend, the Crips and the Bloods are a violent street gang that shoot, kill, and maim people 
from New York City to Los Angeles, California. So how can we have the current sitting DA, who is supposed to protect all the communities of Brooklyn, target one community, in this instance, the Orthodox Jewish community, and say that they're worse than a bunch of criminals? That is outrageous. That is disgraceful. And now he attempts to apologize? It could be its rhetoric designed to address the issue of the fact that when we have a molester or when we have someone harming members of the community, it's very, very difficult to bring that person down. But do we want the most powerful person in law enforcement in Brooklyn to call an entire community and describe them as worse than the mafia? I think that's more than rhetoric. That's, that's outrageous conduct that is unfit in terms of being DA. You cannot target an entire community and say I, that. I don't know that that's what he meant. Uh, well, that's what he said, and we can yeah, only take based no, on what he said. No, but he was referring to specific instances of people that, uh, that are preventing uh, other people you know, from, uh, from speaking up for victims. He and said that they are worse than the mafia. Yeah, and but to he's me, referring to the people. I mean, I know that I'm familiar with the context of what he said it in. He said it referring to people that stop voices to try and uh, to try and help victims. So, in other what, words, if someone's victimized, right? There, there is all sorts of things that happen to them. There are repercussions. Their kids, if if they speak up, their kids can't go to schools. They can't go to camps. And that was the context he was referring to. But when you speak like that. What you do is you send a message to everyone else in Brooklyn that are going to believe that everyone in the Orthodox Jewish community okay. is yes. like that. And I think as I DA, he has an obligation to make sure that all of our communities, we have different cultures, different you know, ways of life, but we're one borough. And you can't divide the borough and say one segment of the borough is worse than the mafia or they like the Crips and the Bloods. I just think that that's dangerous. I and the DA should not speak like that. I understand, but I think he was referring to specific members of the community that, that make it difficult for a victim to receive justice. But, but he, uh, he, should, yeah. he did not say that specifically. I, I think he did, but all right, let's, let's move on. Uh, Abe George was the number three man in this election. Uh, he backed out and he endorsed you. Yes. That, that put rocket fuel into your campaign. Uh, how, how was he able to be convinced to, to pull out at this point? All he had to do was to look at Joe Hines and see the mess that he's created in Brooklyn. That Brooklyn DA's office is in crisis. Abe George saw it. I can see it. And Abe, no, George, Abe George put the interests of the people of Brooklyn ahead of his own. At the end of the day, Abe George dropped out and he's now supporting me because Abe George, like me, is determined to make sure that we don't have another four years of Joe Hines' failed leadership. So let me ask you a question. If Abe George didn't pull out, would you have? No, no. When I got into this race, I got into this race to give the people of Brooklyn a choice. Okay. Because we rarely have a choice in a, in a, in a DA's race. I mean, these DA's are rarely challenged. That's why some of them serve until they're 20 or 30 years in office. I was going, when I entered this race, I entered it with the determination to see it all the way to the night that I'm going to be declared the victor on September 10th. Where do you get your sincerity from, your, your earnestness, your dedication? What I believe is, I really believe very strongly in fundamental fairness. And I get that from my mother, Clara Thompson. I mean, my mother is an extraordinary woman. I mean, she literally was left with three kids alone when my father walked out. When we were living in the New York City public housing and she struggled to take care of us. But she never stopped fighting to give us a better life. And in 1973, she decided to become a New York City police officer. And she became one of the first women to go on patrol in the history of the New York City Police Department. That was extraordinary because at that time, there were very few women police officers entering the academy. And so for 21 years, my mother served the people of New York as a police officer and raised three kids. And she taught me as a young child to stand up for people who are being 
taken advantage of to fight against injustice. She gave me a tremendous example of courage. She put her life on the line for me and my brother and sister. And she didn't have to do that. And so because of her, I've always felt strongly about issues of justice, issues of fairness, issues of equality. And so because of her, I was able to go through the public school system, go to John Jay College, graduated with honors, and go to NYU Law School and end up working in President Clinton's Treasury Department before I came back home and served as a federal prosecutor. I am the way I am today because of the great example I was given in my mother. How did you, I'm sure there was the temptation to play on the street and not do homework and that kind of thing. Well, my mother was so strong in my life. I mean, think about it. She was a police officer walking the beat in 1973 when crime was rampant. So you're saying if she tells you to do homework and she's got a gun, you listen? No, no, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that I had a powerful mother who loved me and did not give up on me. And because of her sacrifice, I feel that I have an obligation to do my part for the people of Brooklyn. This Brooklyn DA's office is in crisis, and we need a new DA. Joe Hines has been in for 23 years, and he has done some innovative programs in 1990, like the drug treatment program. But it is now 2013, and every day we're opening up the newspapers and learning about new scandals coming out of that office. Innocent people being wrongfully convicted for murders that they didn't commit because of prosecutorial or police misconduct. How can we accept that in Brooklyn? Because when that happens, the innocent person who goes to prison, that person's life is destroyed. That person's family's life is destroyed, and the guilty remain free to continue to kill, rob, and hurt us. And so we need to have confidence in the convictions coming out of that office. And you have these federal judges doing something that's extraordinary. Federal judges right down the street from the Brooklyn DA's office have reviewed these wrongful conviction cases. They've overturned those convictions, and they've severely criticized the Brooklyn DA. One judge said that the Brooklyn DA's conduct in one of the cases was, quote, shameful. Another judge said that there was horrific behavior by one of Joe Hines' top deputies, Mike Vecchione. Another judge said that the case that he looked at was rotten from day one. We in Brooklyn must have fundamental fairness in the criminal justice system. We can't have a prosecutor that is either asleep at the switch or is just so determined to get a conviction at all costs. Because no matter what happens, the process has to be fair. Because once the process no longer is fair, we're all in jeopardy. Any of us can be falsely accused, put on trial, and convicted for a crime that we did not commit. And I feel very strongly about the fact that we need to change things. And we're not going to change it if Joe Hines remains in office. How are you going to address the, uh, the drug problem? There's a major drug problem in Brooklyn, and uh, that's probably the, the motor, the vehicle, for a lot of the uh, thefts, a lot of the other activities. What, what are you going to do to, uh, to tackle that issue? What we have to do is we first have to get our priorities in order. We have to see all the folks who are coming into the criminal justice system to ask ourselves, do all of them deserve to be in there? Because each person that comes in has to you have to devote money and resources to prosecuting that person. People are now being, being brought into the criminal justice system for riding bikes on the sidewalk, for taking two seats on the subway. I want to go after those who are walking down the street with the intent to rape, the intent to rob, the intent to kill, the intent to scam our elderly. I think that we have to deal with the drug dealing in Brooklyn, but we also have to deal with the gun violence. Gun violence is literally putting us all in jeopardy. Isn't the gun violence being driven by the drug problem? Drugs and guns often go hand in hand, but what's also driving the gun violence are these gangs, these violent gangs in Brooklyn. We must deal with these gangs. And I am very interested in doing all I can to deal with the drug problem, deal with the gang problem, deal with the gun problem. But guess what? We have a DA now who is checked out. Joe Hines doesn't even live in Brooklyn. He lives in a house in a gated community in the Breezy Point section of Queens. He has written 
multiple books of fiction. He teaches at every law school he can teach in, and he just finished working on his reality TV show. All the while, Brooklyn has the lowest felony conviction rate in the entire city. Brooklyn has the second lowest felony conviction rate for gun crimes, the second lowest felony conviction rate for violent crimes, the second lowest felony conviction rate for, folk, for people who go to trial. We have got to have a DA who's a hands-on prosecutor who's tough but fair. And Joe Hines has lost complete control over the office. Okay. Uh, my last question was, uh, what are your thoughts on that reality television show, <laughs> Brooklyn DA? My thoughts is that it was a publicity stunt. It was a waste of time. It was an embarrassment. It was only put together to bolster his campaign for Brooklyn DA, his re-election campaign. I know of an incident where there was a training session and prosecutors were being trained and Joe Hines walked into the training session with a CBS camera and actors who served as fillers. What is going on? We need a DA who's gonna get up every morning to keep us safe, to make sure that everyone is treated fairly. Not a DA who's interested in, in, in having television cameras follow them around throughout the day. And that's why he's checked out. He's lost touch. And when you think about it, when he ran for DA and he won the first time, what did he do after his first term? He ran for attorney general in 1994 and lost. Then four years later, he ran for governor in 1998 and lost again. So the Brooklyn DA's office has been sort of a consolation prize for Joe Hines. And I don't think that's right. I think that's, that position is too important to have somebody occupied who's checked out. I live in Brooklyn with my wife and two kids. I come home to Brooklyn. I am concerned about Brooklyn. And I'm going to serve the people of Brooklyn with honor and distinction as Brooklyn DA. Well, it was a, a pleasure, pleasure meeting you. Thank uh, you. I can see that you're a man of integrity. Thank you. And uh, I wish you uh, the best of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you.